thanks again for, for coming along. And um, what I'd like to do in this session is, is take 10 or 15 minutes to, to talk through uh, understanding mental fatigue experienced by people with cerebral palsy. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk through this um, today, but I'm really doing so on behalf of uh, other members of the CP Achieve team as well. So Robbie, Susan, uh, Jacinta, Leanne, Stacy, uh, Dinah and Dave, who've all been working on this uh, for the last kind of uh, year or so. And um, we'll talk about what we've done to date and also um, what we plan to do in the future. Um, first, I'd just like to start with a, a quick acknowledgement of country. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and to pay our respects to the elders past, pres past and present. Uh, we extend our respect to the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander colleagues and guests who are present today. So yeah, I guess over the next kind of uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, what I'll do is, is start with a bit of background. Um, I'll talk generally uh, on fatigue first to then uh, narrow things down towards um, talking about mental fatigue. Uh, I'll share the results of a study that we published th uh, this year, uh, which was a systematic review uh, on assessment tools, um, and also talk through the next steps, so our plans for 2024 uh, and beyond. So a bit of background just to start on, on how we got here. Um, it was actually back in 2020. Uh, we, we met with CP Unite, our consumer engagement uh, team, uh, to, to, and asked them to try and help us identify areas of physical health that we thought we could address um, in the context of CP Achieves objectives. We wanted to break down physical health into bite-sized pieces and break it down into pieces that, that were important to, to people with CP. And fatigue was identified as one of these things that was, uh, that was really quite important, a major issue. Um, which was impacting many aspects of life. And uh, what CP Unite were able to do was, was give us lots of practical examples about uh, how fatigue was influencing um, education uh, and recreation. Since then, we've kind of continued those conversations and we've had lots of others echoing and reinforcing this idea that fatigue is something that, that really gets in the way of life uh, and needs to be addressed. So coupled with what we learned from CP Unite. We, we also went to, to the literature and, and to the scientific evidence to find out what, uh, what is known about fatigue. And just as a brief overview, uh, we know that up to 40% of adults with CP report higher levels of fatigue than the, than the rest of the population. Um, fatigue adver adversely affects health-related quality of life, uh, independence in daily activities, as well as functional mobility. We know that fatigue is experienced most frequently, but, but not exclusively by people with CP at GMFCS level three, four, and five. So people with more complex CP who use wheeled mobility for all or most of the time. Uh, unfortunately, the underpinning mechanisms are relatively poorly understood. So we don't really know uh, why this happens um, or how it happens. And part of the reason we don't understand that may well be attributed to a lack of consensus on the definition of fatigue. It's quite hard to define because it seems to be experienced differently by, by different people. So uh, sometimes it's, it's a, physical, uh, a physical feeling. Uh, sometimes there's cognitive or mental fatigue. Sometimes we hear about emotional fatigue or weariness. Uh, so actually getting a really good handle on what this is um, and how to define it is quite difficult. And that's probably limited progress to date. Uh, the, the other thing that, that might be limiting us is, is the fact that there's a lot of variation in how people are assessing fatigue. Um, so sometimes it's objective. So a researcher can, um, can carry out kind of tests to detect fatigue or track fatigue. Uh, and sometimes it's self-report. So we ask people um, and, and they tell us, uh, how much fatigue or how they're feeling. And, and obviously those two ways of assessing fatigue are very different. And if we have different uh, methods of assessment um, throughout uh, our research, we can't really get a handle on things uh, without that consistency. Uh, and that second point there was really um, what we wanted to, to look at first. So variation assessment methods, we wanted to hone in on actually how we're assessing fatigue. And we did that through through a systematic review. Uh, and this was a study that we um, published this year. So that the aim of this review was to identify and appraise uh, self and proxy reported fatigue assessment tools. 
uh, and then develop a fatigue assessment tool decision tree for clinicians so that to help them choose um, which uh, which tool to use in what situation. So we did this search of five electronic research databases um, and we uh, identified all these studies uh, that assess fatigue in people uh, with CP of any age. And then what two of us did um, was look at all these different assessment tools and identify the type, domain and time frame of fatigue that was measured, uh, the population in which the tool was developed, because obviously it's not always people with cerebral palsy. Uh, we looked at the psychometric properties, so how reliable and how valid the scales were in people with CP. We also looked at whether they could discriminate uh, fatigue from other symptoms. Uh, and we also looked at whether they were responsive to change, so whether those scales were suitable for detecting changes in fatigue in response to intervention. And overall, we looked at also the purpose and the clinical utility of each of these scales. So we really got into the details of what they tell us and what jobs they do. And this is the result. So this is quite a lot in here, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. Um, so we originally identified 759 studies. Um, 39 of those met the inclusion criteria for our study. So uh, 39 studies actually assess fatigue in people with CP. Of those 39, across those 39 studies, we found 10, 10 assessment tools, and they're presented in this, uh, this figure here. So starting on the right-hand side in green, what we've got is, is cognitive fatigue. And we didn't identify any tools that were um, solely used for measuring cognitive fatigue. There, we, there wasn't anything out there. Uh, in purple, in the middle there, what we've got is measures of physical and cognitive fatigue. So we found six, six measures that did that. Um, two measured severity only, so how much, how, how severe the physical and cognitive fatigue was, and four of them measured how severe it was, as well as the impact on daily activities. Unfortunately, in none of those six tools um, was there any evidence of validity and reliability. So we're not actually sure if those tools do, do the job that, that they um, say they're going to do for us in people with, with cerebral palsy. Uh, over on the left, we've got in the blue, we've got physical fatigue measures. And there was four of those that we identified. Uh, one measured severity only and three measured severity in, and impact on daily activities. Um, and three of them actually had evidence of re reliability and validity in, in people with cerebral palsy. So that's the PEDSQUAL cerebral palsy module. Um, the fatigue impact and severity self-assessment and the global, global physical health scale. So really our recommendations are to use those three tools, um, for cl clinicians to use those three uh, tools, but to do so with caution because they, they don't assess um, the full spectrum of fatigue domains. They don't assess cognitive fatigue and their responsiveness to change is also unclear. We don't know whether um, they, they would respond to change appropriately if there was actually a change in, in fatigue. Um, there's actually no valid and reliable tools which assess cognitive and mental fatigue that have been used widely in people with CP um, and, and none that are known to be responsive to change. So really the, the, the next step from our review is that, that further work is needed here to, to understand fatigue beyond just the physical domain where we have uh, valid and reliable measures, um, but but more consideration of it as a complex and multi-dimensional construct. Um, and the last thing is that mental fatigue is really quite understudied. We didn't identify any any tools there that um, that, that had been used. And and this last point is really where we're going next. Um, and it does uh, kind of you know dictate our next step. So I'll shift now from talking about the work that we've done previously and towards the, the next steps uh, that we'd like to do into 2024 and beyond. But it is very much in development. So I'm interested in hearing thoughts and feedback and uh, and discussion on this because uh, we're still refining this and, and still um, working towards getting this organized. But uh, here, here's our ideas. Um, so starting with what we know about mental fatigue in people with CP, um, Anecdotally, people with CP have described both the presence and effect of mental fatigue on, on daily tasks. 
Uh, in the literature, there's, it's slightly different. So there's one study that actually reported no difference whatsoever in the level of mental fatigue between adults with CP and without CP. Uh, but in that study, uh, mental fatigue was assessed using uh, a subscale of a fatigue questionnaire, which only had six questions in it. And there's no evidence of reliability or validity in people with CP in that scale. So we've got to be a bit careful about how we interpret that evidence. There is a scale out there that we're interested in, the, the modified mental fatigue scale. Um, it's yet to be used widely in people with cerebral palsy, but there is some evidence of validity um, in a small sample of people with CP. So it's something that we're interested in. And, and just um, the reason we're interesting, interested in it because it's because it asks different types of questions uh, to those that have been asked before. So just to give you an idea, of what these questions are. Um, there's 14 of them in this scale and, and they're relating to you know things like concentration difficulties, memory problems, slowness of thinking and sensitivity to stress, um, maybe tendency to become emotional or irritable, um, sensitivity to light or noise and sleep pattern changes. So that can be um, either more sleep or disrupted sleep or, or less less sleep um, as well. So th these are quite different questions to, to what have been asked before, which are usually around elements of physical fatigue. So we're certainly interested in using this scale. Uh, so the two next steps that we're really considering is, is using this scale to find out how much of a problem mental fatigue is. Uh, and secondly, gain a better understanding of how mental fatigue is experienced by people with CP. Um, so starting with that first question there, how much of a problem it is, um, we're, we're proposing this, this kind of study that aims to estimate the prevalence of self-reported mental fatigue using that modified mental fatigue scale. We'd also like to explore the association of mental fatigue with level of functioning, um, neurological subtypes, so the type of cerebral palsy, uh, as well as pain and depressive symptoms. And we'll do that with what I hope will be quite a short questionnaire. Um, and that questionnaire uh, will comprise some demographic data, so age, uh, other diagnoses, um, the two fatigue scales, so the mental fatigue scale, as well as the FISA, which was identified in our review. Uh, then we'll have a, a pain measure and a measure of depressive symptoms. And hopefully this will allow us to understand uh, how much of a problem this is, but also whether mental fatigue tends to cluster with uh, other problems, uh, other symptoms. Uh, and also it might help us to untangle uh, symptoms of fatigue from, from other things. Uh, so it will give us a bit of insight into, into what's going on. Um, I think we need to couple that with understanding uh, the experience of mental fatigue um, in people with CP through, through interviews and, and focus groups to get a bit more depth to our understanding. So hopefully um, in the second half of next year, we'll be able to interview people and, uh, and do some focus groups to understand uh, how fatigue, how mental fatigue feels, what causes it, um, uh, sometimes what relieves it, if there's uh, that kind of depth that we, that we want to get to. And what we'll do with these focus groups is map uh, the information to um, one of two things, either the, the uh, cognitive and sensory domains of something called the RDOC matrix um, or the ICF and LIFE H. And what this will allow us to do is use a systematic approach uh, to understanding the information that we're given in order to develop a framework. Um, and from that framework and from this, this uh, greater level of understanding, what we'd like to do is uh, potentially develop another measure um, of of mental fatigue that would need to need to do more than the modified mental fatigue scale does for us now. Um, so hopefully something that might be responsive to change that we could use in intervention trials. Uh, that's that's something that we're uh, considering at the moment. But what we hope to achieve from these two studies is is to gain a better understanding of how much of a problem mental fatigue is, how is ex how it's experienced, and how to measure it. And I think. If we can do those things uh, in the long run, what we'd like to do is improve assessment of fatigue in clinical practice, make it more holistic, go beyond just this idea that it's just a, a physical um, issue, a physical feeling, seems to be much more than that. So the more holistic we can be, uh, the better. 
And secondly, um, in the long run, we'd like to be able to evaluate interventions to help people with CP and clinicians uh, manage fatigue more effectively. And if we understand uh, a bit more about it and we know how to measure it, uh, that'll really help us to, uh, to do that. So what I'd like to do, I guess, for the rest of the time, and I'm happy to, to chat for as long as we like, um, is I, I, questions, but also discussion points. Um, you know, are we on the right path here? Is there anything we're missing? Uh, and yeah, happy to take in any other comments or questions. Um, I'll just say thank you very much for this thing. And also, um, this is our, our contact details. So if, uh, if you'd like to uh, contact us outside of, outside of this session, yeah, we'd be very happy to to hear from you there as well.